Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bob Rico. I'm the RMJ team and Daniel for Centos, and I'm also a member of the Centos QA team. Uh, basically, this talk is playing with RMHFP devices. Uh, I'm not planning on this to be too, too formal, or, so if you need to ask any questions, please jump in and, and ask them. Uh, my idea was, originally was to speak for 10 15 minutes about the common misconceptions and the common problems that people usually have with this when we starting to play with the, in the world with small devices and and then hopefully some someone will play with their own devices if not they have some here with me to play uh, yeah, that was that was basically the, the idea uh, a little background uh, a few years ago I got involved in a project using a banana pie just like this one I have right here and, <clears throat> and it wasn't exactly easy to get started, mostly because documentation was non-existent or impossible to understand. And I have absolutely no idea. So, so yeah, it was it was it wasn't exactly a, a smooth process. Uh, the idea is to give us uh, a simple overview uh, of how the boot process uh, works, a uh, few of the terminology, and then we will see if we have time to play with some devices. That URL is basically where all the uh, center's information for RMHP is kept. We try to keep it updated, but it never is. So, if you come, have some questions and or find anything missing, we'll try to update it. And if you have um, permission to update the wiki, just just can do it yourselves. Uh, okay, I changed the order too many times because I didn't know what if to start with explanations or with the common problems, but. Let's start with this. I hope I didn't get it wrong. Uh, it should just work. Most people expect that devices should just work. Why doesn't it just work? Uh, well, while we are all used to x86 where you just plug in the, the ISO and whatever and start booting. It doesn't happen this way. And these devices are basically to them to know how to do that, as we'll see during the boot process explanation. The second one, if device X works, then device Y should work too. Not even close. Uh, they are, the only common thing between all our RMHP devices are their differences. So nothing looks like the other. Uh, and the third one is a little more technical. Uh, <coughs> when you look at the specs of these devices, uh, you normally expect for all that is that it says there to, to be working at the same time. And it's normally not possible because the pins in the GPIO tend to, tend to overlap. So you can't enable all the things you see available together at the same time. Uh, we are used to x86, uh, where the whole process is pretty simple. Even if you don't have storage, you can see the BIOS or the EFI shell at least uh, to see that the device is doing at least something. Uh, these devices basically, uh, all, they, all they know is a point in the storage where to start looking for the boot process. That's it. If that is not there, you're done. If what you put there doesn't belong to that device, you're done. 
So you need to know exactly what you put and where to put it because an um, offset of one sector makes it not work at all. It basically how things are kept, kept simple because the, the processor doesn't know absolutely anything. It just calls for the software to do everything. Well, this is where you would come in. There are other devices that have other methods of body, but you would is usually the most common, common one besides the Raspberry Pi, which is a whole different world. Uh, you would need to be, needs to be built specifically for that device. And I'm not even meaning this, the, the processor itself, the device, because it has a lot of information in there that tells, that later tells the kernel how exactly to set up the hardware that is included. Uh, the Raspberry Pi is completely different because it uses uh, some closed source executables that are, you can reveal, you just have to trust that they do what they, they say they do. And the processor knows how to read it and it starts moving from there. Once, uh, you put, uh, once those executables are run, you can boot directly into the kernel or you can boot into U boot to continue the process the way the other processors boot normally. That is the way the generic image works for CentOS. So, executable, U boot, kernel. And the Raspberry Pi specific version doesn't use U boot. Is uh, Raspberry Pi executable, kernel direct. So we have both, depending on which image was selected when you know that from the center. Okay, who knows what a DTV or a DTS is? And don't say the tool set. <laughs> and if you think in cake pop, that's BTS. So, nope. Last two systems? Mm -hmm. Device tree system? Source, but yes. The, that's device tree blob, device tree source. The device tree blob is actually a compiled version of the device tree source. And it's a binary definition of all the hardware that it's supposed to be included, or at least defined, for each device. Uh, that is basically how the kernel knows uh, what to enable, how to enable it, and which drivers attach to each and every one of them. Uh, everything is just made static at boot time. There's no hardware detection, there's no API, there's no anything. It's read the DTB and go from there. Uh, the DTB actually contains some tags called compatible, which uh, are how the kernel knows which drivers to attach basically acts like the, like the device ID that we know in typical PCI or USB. Okay, BSP versus mainline. BSP, anybody knows what, is, what it is? Board support package. Yeah, that's it. Board support package, and, but actually it should be BP because support is usually <laughs> out of the question. But once they release the device, they forget about it. Uh, what happens is mainly the vendor takes a kernel from usually prehistoric, they, they, I've, been seen, I've seen 3.4, maybe 3.10. They add some, some patches to make it work, to make the device they want work. And they, they throw in some random distro. I don't know why they never use the same. And that's basically it. Once the once they, the device is, is released, they never update it anymore. And yeah, it works, but it's not something realistically usable. On the other hand, we have mainland, which we offer repairing mainland to both U-Boot and Kernel. And the thing about mainline is that it's a moving target because 
constantly new process, new process of support are added, new device supports are added, new, de new devices are added. So if, the thing is, if it doesn't work today, it doesn't mean it won't work in the next version. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's kind of in constant evolution. The problem is that this evolution is being done mostly by, by community members. Some vendors have some support and or even sponsor the, the drivers, but it's not like you can plan ahead and say, well, this device has included this and this, maybe it will include this other part in the near future. It's not something you can plan ahead. I was hoping you could read something from there, but no. <laughs> okay, and the next minute. <laughs> this chart is uh, is basically a page that follows the uh, which drivers and which uh, pro which processors are added to the to the kernel of the all winner run uh, all winner render. For instance, I took an example. The crypto engine was added for the A20, which is a specific processor, it was added for kernel 4.3. And which is device like this one. For the R40, the same crypto engine, the driver was added in 5.5. 5. 5. 5. Which means uh, for CentOS that if we won't have it until they release the next LTS, which will be around 5.9, I think. So basically, we won't have it for another year, at least. But crypto engine is not exactly something that really matters for us right now. But it's an example of how the these things evolve in China. Is this all winner? Specifically, uh, contributed support or kernel, or is it something that is being done by the company? It's normally sponsored by companies. Uh, this is only for uh, all winner because that's the page I found. Yeah. But uh, as I understand it, it's uh, it's community members and maybe companies that sponsor developers to do whatever they they need for them. But it's not like the all winner itself is sponsoring developers to to do for mainland car. That's not gonna happen. So I couldn't decide so I'll get both. The beginning and the end. <laughs> the first one is really common. My Wi-Fi doesn't work. Uh, what happens is most of the time there's a TXT file that needs to be added with the firmware that the, so that the driver can load it at good time, otherwise it won't work. How do we know which, which one we need? Trial and error. No other way. <laughs> uh, normally, if the v you can get the VSP for your board, you could try to use the one that is in the VSP, but it may or may not work. Uh, just find a, find a bunch, try them on, reboot, and try again. That, but it's, yeah, that's basically how it happened. There's some newer support for this uh, in the Linux firmware package. There are some TXTs, for example, the Raspberry Pi 3, I guess, that is already included in the kernel, in the Linux, sorry, in the Linux firmware package. So it's going in the right direction. And the other one is my Mac address is different after every reboot. Uh, that one is basically a relation between U-boot and the kernel. Uh, they don't all have the same information. So the Mac is invented by U-boot at a uh, time. Once, uh, normally once you would is, is updated to support that car, or, or at least to have its correct definition, it will work and the kernel will have the, a stable a stable map. Mm, 
you can plan around that. So basically, you just add MAC address to the config, just pick the MAC and forget about it. Forget about keyboard and monitor. This is what you need for this device. Uh, because many, many times uh, the VCA output or HDMI or whatever is not may not even be implemented in the drivers. So the device is booting, it's working, but you just can see it. And other times, there are devices that don't even have um, video connected. <coughs> so basically, that is the best way to, the best and maybe the only way to actually monitor what, what is going on with the, with the boot process and, and everything. Most important thing about this, don't ever, 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 ever connect the red wire. <laughs> Under any circumstances, the red wire should be cut, soldered, or whatever, but it's never to be used because it, is, it has the 5 volts power and it's not what it was. So forget it. Okay, basically, some, some links and pointers, and that's it. Let's go to play. Any questions? Uh, comments um, regarding the last slide. Um, depending on, on the implementation of Google, Polyboard, or whatever the, the board uses, um, mainly TTY is really your. Sorry, I'm having trouble. I'm sorry. Is really your best friend because sometimes you can actually control the bootloader already on the on the V24 level. Can you start Yes, sorry. Um, Regarding your last slide, why is the serial connection important? Depending on the bootloader, uh, on, on the particular implementation of the bootloader, a serial connection is your best friend because most of the time you actually can control bootloader behavior right on the serial, uh, on, on the serial TY interface. Yeah. Uh, meaning, yes, depending on the, on the layout of the platform, you may actually have different kernels at your disposal that you can boot your user and up with. Yeah. This is really kind of something that's very important. Yeah, that, and more, uh, even sometimes you have a uh, video, you can see what is going on, but it just appears too late for you to modify anything that is going on at home. Sometimes it's not even initialized, sometimes yeah. it doesn't work, sometimes the, <laughs> the interface is screwed. I've seen it all happening. <laughs> all, all, all happening. I mean, so, yeah. But only if you're out of the field, carry a certain connection with you. Yeah. That was ours. <laughs> that, that's basically it. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Um, what about 64 bit support? Will you do that in your sick as well? Or? Well, 64 bit support. Uh, that's a bit different because someone defined to me today really good with that. With 64, you have. Servers and you have toys. These are toys. Basically, what I do with this device to set up the 64 bit is take the whole user space from CentOS, forget about the kernel, build the same kernel that we built for this device, and it's basically the latest LTS with a few with a few parts uh, added. And it's just it, it just works. Uh, just works with the same restraints that I explained for the others. But, but yeah, that's that's basically it. If you have your boot uh, uh, for your device and the, the device tree is there, concepts are basically the same. Yeah. So, yeah, you mentioned the whole place around the device support. Uh, how did the user use and all that stuff? Are, are there any plans to, to start something like TQ IP? Mm -hmm. Not that I know. So, sorry. Um, so, there's a thing called the DVR, uh, which is embedded boot requirement, uh -huh. which doesn't tell you if you need particular, for example, the TPI stuff. Mm -hmm. So, for example, again, we used to can't afford if you use most of the five stuff. 
um, and then you can use the DVD stuff. Uh, so if you have a use, for example, the way we open the system, the newer version from the SDC AA the toys, it's the same as in the server. Well, not exactly. You don't use your file server like camera for commercial files. You use keyboot, which has a defined implementation when you load graph 2, which uses DLS, Google Earth, back and then move. So basically, at some point, um, that in graph 2, it's the same stuff as moving on a feed, at least from user perspective. Yeah. And time, but time you see scary things that need to be. Uh, basically, uh, even you put this strange one secure world, I mean, yeah, you know, that's 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 stuff. but it's basically mo most of the work for those things are being done at you would level, so, or, or any other good level level. So if they can get all the compliance and get the operating system to load in a standard way. Today in CentOS, we don't even use RAW to put these devices. We use XT Linux because basically it's easier and the RAW interaction is a mess. And actually, they broke it one or two releases ago. I don't know if they fixed it already. I don't know, but I know it's really complete. Every distro has like loads of packets to work. Do you think there's a packet problem tomorrow? Yeah. How to kind of converge? Yeah, so. Basically, all the work, the work is being done to unify. It's not being done at hardware level, but at the good level software level. And just uh, for some who don't know what XLS is, it's basically XLS. So you can support that. It's same code path. Uh, so XLS is a can fit locally in a flash boot partition, which can be used for flash boot partition. And it doesn't support all the all the options that the external you know, provider for the basic one. For example, even if you said that you have multiple entries in the kernel and you have a default, that's not going to work. You're going to say, I don't know what uh, that is. So the first one, yeah. the first entry is the one that's going to boot if you're not going to select one at the boot time. If you want to either you select or you edit and uh, reload. Yeah. But change the entry part, and I'm going to try to boot one of the devices now, and you'll see that. It says entry blah blah blah, ignore, entry blah blah blah, ignore, because it, and one of those entries is the default. Yeah, the fix is that you can do on the external instance page very easy to use there is you can have multiple entries for different kernels. Um, you can modify your kernel arguments. You don't need to kind of build into a kernel and have a be compiled kernel. Um, you can uh, external load the DD entry. There is a FDT or FD0 option. You can specify how to find it. The device needs, for example, if you want to modify it, and again, you don't want to deal with the server or something, it's just easier. Uh, so you can basically select just a kernel image and put it in the camera. Yeah, that's One important thing about the TTL the first time you always want to plug it on. And maybe the second time too.
Let's try the way I say don't try. <laughs> Once you get to that point, it's basically your regular Linux, your regular sentence, and you can do whatever you want as far as the processor. <laughs> Supports it. Um, I've actually used devices like this for, I don't know, web server, uh, and, uh, stream servers. I just got one Raspberry Pi hanging behind the TV to use as a, as a media center. The, the idea for the availability of these devices is to have a cheap way to, to have a Linux server available without actually having the, the cost of having a, a Linux server available. You're not going to do some, something that requires too much computing, but at least you have something to SSH into and go from there. That is Basically, it. Uh, there are some newer devices which have some more power, but more on the arch system, on the 64 bit side, no, not as much in the 32. 32 is struggling a little bit. It's nice to have devices like this with, uh, with native SATA. It's that it really changes the the way because normally SD cards are not very reliable, so so it is it is a problem. They tend to corrupt a lot. So having native native SATA is you just stick uh, U boot in the SD card because normally those dev many devices require at least one SD card to boot because that's the only way they know how to boot. And then you offload the whole operating system to the to the SATA disk. Or if you're lucky enough and your device has eMMC, you could copy you to the eMMC and actually go from there to the hard disk and continue from there. And you would, in that case, you shouldn't need uh, an SD card. Oh, yeah. Did you play that much with the GPIO capabilities uh, regarding also some, some tuning of the centers on the system for some better near real-time behavior? Sorry. So are you using the, the, these ARM boxes only as servers or also um, as, as hardware gadgets that can control things via GPIO pins and yeah. where you need some timing and uh, they usually you we can hit the spot where you see Linux is no real time operating system. But you, of course, you can tune things, or perhaps there are some devices you, you have used uh, that have some hardware interrupts that can help you with timing or To be honest, I'm not a very GPIO user. Uh, mostly what I do with GPIO is enable more work calls. That's basically it. More work calls? More serial calls. Work uh, uh, So. I couldn't tell you if you need a bit by bit reading or something like that with that special timing. <coughs> Maybe you could tweak the curtain a bit too, to get a little fast around those, those kind of things. But to be honest, I can't, I can't try it very much. I, I guess I know we use serial codes and that's pretty much handled within the parameters of the, of the normal kernel. So it's not going to be a big problem. If you have a problem with it, you can check it out. 
Yeah, I had a project that's actually working, but I'm importing kind of a dog matrix display with a special history. Yeah. And I'm using SBI, which works uh, nice. You get a number of bits across um, and some manual bit banging, but the main problem is I have to wait for the physical display hardware uh, for an amount of like 30 microseconds or so. Yeah. And the only way I have to wait exactly is for the clock. Am I there yet? Am I there yet? And then uh, I can keep uh, one one gig and some CPU really busy with really nothing. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, not that. <laughs> so of course it's a job for a proper microcontroller actually. I guess the best would be to have an Arduino and connect it to the. Uh, yeah, in that case, <coughs> and at least you have full control of the user most of the time. Bad thing it works. In this case, from an old, old uh, big computer from the 70s, and of course, the little box, and there is wasting really, really a multiple of the computer on the original device there. Yeah. To emulate some aspects of it. Yeah. And we I, have, I have one more thing with this. Okay. A new hardware I just got a few days ago. Yes, sure. Running, running them for a longer time. Uh, what CPU temperatures on these, like an all winter chip, do you consider good for a long time operation? Or good enough? Basically, it depends on which 
which one we're using in the, uh, the specs. I haven't still found anyone beside the Raspberry, the Raspberry Pi 4 that is actually really, really hot. I haven't found any problems with the other common devices. Even the Raspberry Pi 3 or, or all the ones I have right there, uh, I haven't found many, many issues with temperature, even in horrible conditions, but inside the ceiling or whatever. Uh, I have an Enough Pi and an N2 Plus. And an N2 Plus. Oh, that's, that's, that's all the my H3. Yeah, I'm trying to think which, which stock is it? H2? Seymour or Dust? 
think so. They can. <laughs> I think so. They could be more. They could be more lost. Uh, to be honest, I would like to use the integrator. Try just to use the minimum as possible to just start to put it there and forget about the rest. Okay. Well, but for this one, I normally use the deep read solution. So you just have to use the adapter, the next thing you need, and you just use it. That's the way I, I, I don't, don't think they, they added the USB. They were working on it. The first version didn't support it. Once that's that's working and we can just remove the SD cards, that's going to be okay. And at least we'll have three times. Well, at least don't put it in so much. Yeah. Or spend an important amount of money in the SD card, which is going to be four times what the battery back was. Can you imagine 50 bucks for this, 200 bucks for this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or more. <laughs> That's easy. When you get these. Hmm? When you get these special SD cards. Uh, mouse. From some vendors. Yeah. Some, some, some special Panasonic SD cards. High temperature, high. Right? High rates. Usually, I instead of 10k rice, um, 100k. So, uh, if you do wear that, in, then wear balancing. So, if you start moving the bits around, so the wear is balancing. Like normal SSD. But, I'm not serious. <laughs> okay. That's it. We're done. Thank you, people. <laughs> <laughs>